Welcome back. This is my Vile Smasher and Thrasios Triton Hero deck. Uh, this is one of my uh, handful of Partner Commander decks. Um, this deck started out as a Vile Smasher only Rakdos deck. Uh, the first time I saw Vile Smasher play, I loved the, the way the effect played. I loved the excitement about figuring out who was going to take damage. And I thought that effect was just too fun not to play. So I went ahead and built it and made it my, uh, my first Rakdos deck. And I quickly realized that I needed card draw and I needed ramp really, really badly for Vile Smasher to function. So I went ahead and looked for green cards or green partner commanders that I could add to the deck uh, in order to give Vile Smasher access to green. I quickly realized that of all of the other 14 options that I had, uh, once I whittled it down to just the green ones, Thrasios was the only good option. And he also provided me access to blue, which was fine by me because I did not have a whitelist deck and this enabled me for that. Plus, the two have pretty good synergy. Uh, Vile Smasher, on its surface, uh, how because it does damage equal to the first spell you've cast each turn, um, it's a very mana-hungry deck. It asks you to cast large spells in order to get the most out of its effect. And if you're going to cast large spells, then of course you need lots and lots of mana. And the one thing that Thrasios really asks of you is to produce a lot of mana. The more mana that you can produce, the better each of these commanders are. So they work very handy. They ask for the exact same thing. Give me a lot of mana and we'll get you the rest of the way there. Uh, usually Thrasios, uh, early in the game, um, when I need to be able to get hit my land drops or I need to add cards to my hand and I can't cast stuff big enough for Vile Smasher to be very effective and I don't want to appear very scary yet, uh, Thrasios provides that early game uh you know, interaction gives me something to do with my mana. And then late game, when I have excessive amounts of mana, and I don't have quite enough mana to double spell, I can, uh, every time I've got four additional mana, um, I can just throw it in him, and or you throw it into his uh, activated ability, and immediately get something for it. And he is crazy powerful. Of course, there's a reason that he is one of the most consistently used CEDH commanders, is because four colorless mana with no tap requirement uh, means that he is crazy broken, uh, but first and foremost, Vile Smasher is the commander that this deck uh, attempts to uh, revolve around. And we hope, you know, we'd like to win the game with his uh, ability. Uh, realistically, he's the only uh, consistent way this deck has to win. Uh, thankfully, they're only two and three mana, respectively. Uh, so they don't ask too much as far as if I have to recast them a few times. And I expect to, because they both provide a pretty big target based on their effectiveness. Uh, sometimes it feels like Vile Smasher is picking on a particular opponent, and they just keep randomly becoming the person that takes the damage. Despite the fact that it's random, uh, sometimes that can mean that it hits the same person three or four times. And since the spells that I cast in this deck often exceed five mana, that can be a third or a half of their life before long. And they start to really take it personally, despite the fact that they're all rolling a die or you know randomly assigning the damage. And... Um, that's to be expected because, you know, once they die, whether it was random or not, they can't play them more. So that works. So these are the commanders. And next we'll go to the creatures. Uh, this deck is all about giving, you know, pushing out lots and lots of damage. And so the first three creatures all do that very, very effectively. Uh, firstly, we have Inferno Titan for six mana. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, it does three damage divided as I choose among one, two, or three target creatures or players. And also when it attacks... Right, so just uh, if I cast it, a Vile Smasher's out, I get the six damage randomly uh, assigned because of the converted mana cost, and then as it enters the battlefield, I get three additional damage. And if I have a haste enabler or any other way to attack, it can be three additional damage. And all of these cards really help me close out the game late. Um, Vile Smasher's random damage is much less random once I get down to two and one opponents, and it really guarantees we all already know who's going to hit. And so it's my best get, you know, my best way to win is to uh, pick an opponent that is providing the biggest interruption for me, or uh, going to be the most likely to win before I can win, and to get them out of the game as soon as possible. And these all stack damage on the board very fast. Uh, Magmatic Force is an, uh, one that also benefits from more players because at the beginning of each upkeep, he deals three damage to a target creature or player. So the more players are in the game. Uh, the more damage that goes around. And so he helps me survive games that are like uh, more than four players, five players, sometimes six player pod. He helps make my uh, my strategy go wider than it would otherwise be because Vile Smasher can often suffer from having more than three opponents. He gets more powerful the fewer opponents we have. So, of course, the more opponents we have, the less powerful he is. And then lastly, Karavek is just a the big brother to Vile Smasher, the, the granddaddy of that effect. And he affects, he triggers off every uh, opponent's spells and so they really 
um, have to either immediately remove him or just stop playing the game, especially if they're the one that I've decided to target first. And uh, it's really fun to play with. Not so much to, fun to play against, but it's very effective. And uh, at some point, you just have to lean into the strategy if you hope to win. Next, we have a pair of uh, very large demons. Uh, starting out with Sower of Discord. It's 4 and 2 black, 6-6 six, six flyer. When it enters the battlefield, I choose two players. And whenever damage is dealt to one of those players, uh, the other player also loses that much life. So, because it's worded to lose his life, it does not, uh, damage cannot be prevented because it's loss of life. And secondly, uh, it really doubles up any of the damage triggers that Vile Smasher has. Uh, another interesting thing you do is that, the, uh, something I've had to do a few times, is at the very, very end of the game, uh, if it's only me and one opponent, and if I happen to have more life than them, then I can name myself and name the other, the, my one opponent. And um, any damage that's dealt to me is dealt to them. And any damage is dealt to them is dealt to me. So it guarantees that I'm going to win the race, right? Uh, unless they have some giant spell that kills me before this effect can take hold. If they can't one-shot me, then, then I'm definitely going to win. And then next we have Archfiend of Despair. It keeps my opponents from getting life, which is very effective in any burn strategy, which is what this is. And then at the beginning of each end step, it wound reflections. Each opponent loses life equal to the most life that they lost this turn. So it doubles up any damage they do. Some of the effects tend to be kind of small, such as the Inferno Titan. You know, just pinging people for three. Or, for example, the Magmatic uh, Force. You know, at the beginning of somebody's upkeep, I hit them for three. And at their end step, they take three more. Six a turn is, you know, very, very relevant. Three can almost be overlooked, especially uh, in the middle of the game when everybody's still got more than 20 life. But that's six damage. If it comes down to six or, you know, doubling whatever, it's just very powerful. And then uh, when, I was ha when I moved into blue and into green, um, I noticed that there were other abilities that I could use. Uh, two abilities in particular. These abilities are Evoke and Delve. Uh, both abilities allow me to spend less mana than the CMC of the card that I'm casting. But it doesn't matter if I've gotten a discount because of the Evoke or because of uh, any other effect. I still hit the person or a person at random with Vile Smasher's ability. So if I choose to cast Shriek my first Evoke ability of 2 mana, he still hits somebody for 5 because that's still the converted mana cost. It doesn't matter. doesn't check to see what I paid for it, right? And Vile's era, the Mold Drifter is the same way. Uh, but, you know, on the surface, the 2 and a blue to draw 2 cards is not great, but then 5 damage coming along with it for only 3 mana is really, really effective. And Evoke cards are just very flavorful for, for what this deck wants to do. And then the very last creature, and by far the most dangerous, that we have in this deck is Seedborn Muse. Uh, Seedborn Muse is an auto-kill in every strategy that you ever see it in. There is not a deck where Seedborn Muse comes out where you can leave it alone. You have to kill it. If you know it's in the deck, you have to save removal for it. Um, the ability to untap all permanents that you control, including your lands, very, very important. Especially in a deck that has a commander that has an activated ability, because I'm guaranteed to have a way to spin that mana. It's not going to just go unused, right? And of course, Thrasios means... Um, that I can just dump all of my excess mana into trying to drop lands and draw cards. And it does it with every single person's turn. So um, the best case scenario that I've seen for this uh, is I have my Thrasios out, and I have my Seedborn Muse out, and during every each opponent's upkeep, if I have eight or more mana, you know, then I'm able to tap him, tap all the mana and spin it on him at least twice, you know, with eight mana, and drop two lands, or drop a land and draw a card, whatever it may be. But either way, at the end of, when it gets back to my turn sometimes, I've had twice as much mana as I started with by the time it was my turn again. And it's just yet another reason why you have to respect the power of Seedborn Muse. Another thing is I have a few cards in this deck that enabled me to cast things at instant speed, despite their sorcery nature, or creatures, whatever they are. And this lets me build, you know... Uh, Untap every turn, cast up at instant speed, trigger Vile Smasher. Since he does trigger off every every spell, or every time I cast my first spell each turn, it doesn't matter whose turn it is, it doesn't have to be my own. And so this that creature works uh, very, very well with every opponent that I have. Now, nextly, we have my artifact cards, uh, starting with Arcane Signet and Soul Ring. Of course, mana fixing is very, very important when you have four colors. Even when you're in green, it's nice to have mana fixing. And uh, Arcane Signet is just really, really efficient. Of course, since I'm in green, I generally don't play a lot of Artifact Ramp uh, because uh, lands just stick around longer. But in Arcane Signet enables me to immediately tap it for mana, and it really color fixes me. And of course, Soul Ring is just uh, mana positive the turn you play it, so it's just too good. When I'm trying to cast 7 and 8 and you know 10 mana spells, Soul Ring is just absolutely necessary to try to be you know in the effort to get there. And next we have a couple more color-fixing artifacts. 
uh, and uh, Mana Ramp Artifacts. That's my Felwar Stone. Often this color taps for at least three of the colors that I want. So it just really, it turns into a poor man's Arcane Signet, uh, which is still a fantastic card. And the Chromatic Lantern, uh, this deck does have several cards which have three uh, color pips in their casting costs. And when you're playing four colors, trying to hit triple red for Magmatic Force uh, can be very, very difficult. Even if you do get to the point of the game where you have eight mana, even with the perfect mana base, Chromatic Lantern still helps me get past that last little bit. Also, if you would like to double spell, that can often represent um, four of the same pip. And uh, Chromatic Lantern really helps me get there because I'm being very greedy with my card choices. It's a necessary inclusion. Uh, next, we have the Immortal Sun. Um, the creature buff doesn't help that much in this deck. Of course, it can get through just a, a little bit more damage. And the Planeswalker ability uh, doesn't seem to come and play very much for my meta because people don't play Planeswalkers that often. Uh, drawing addition card is always good, but mainly this is for my spell or cost reduction. It reduces every spell I cast by one. And this really increases my ability to play something during my turn uh, for reduced cost and trigger Vile Smasher and then save mana up for one of my instant speed spells. Uh, for somebody else's turn in order to be able to trigger Vile Smasher again. You know, when each spell costs one less, that really adds up when you've gotten to your third spell in a go-round. So, very efficient. Uh, nextly, we have two equipment. And this is Basilisk Color and Shadow Sphere. Uh, they both have one very important factor, and that's that they provide lifelink. And Vile Smasher actually say, states that Vile Smasher is the one doing the damage. Although it is non-combat damage, so it doesn't add up for commander damage, it can still uh, deal that damage and gain me life via lifelink. All right, so this will really keep me into in the late game and enable to be to uh, have a much better, better chance to cast my giant spells uh, before people can hate me out of the game. You know, if they've played this deck before, they know to respect it and they know how dangerous it can be. And, uh, you know, it helps to have gained 30, 40 life by the end of my game, especially if I can drop these on curve turn one. Um, you know, it really helps. Uh, life gain is something that's overlooked in Commander often. Uh, but if you're playing regular Commander and the games are uh, the normal 8 to 10 turns, then lifelink can play a very large role in determining who wins and who's alive in the late game to even be there for the part in, you know, the cleanup. And last, we have Lightning Greaves. Both my commanders are extremely important uh, to different phases of the games. And um, this protects whichever one is most important at the time. And this is my uh, beautiful um, promo card from Kaladesh, which I traded a bunch of cards in at a uh, convention for, and I'm very proud of it. It's very pretty. This is one of my favorite decks, so I've got a lot of the cards foiled out or their special promo arts, well, if they have an option for that. And the last artifact I have, as well as the first enchantment I have, is Vidalcanori and Leyline of Anticipation. Uh, because Vile Smasher does say uh, the first card you cast each turn, uh, instant speed is very, very important. However, there's only a limited number of instant speed cards that really do anything that I would like. I do have a small package of instant speed, but this turns all, the, all, all of my remaining cards into instant speed. It also means I can cast my commanders at the end of turn. Since Vile Smasher uh, remembers if uh, she was cast that turn. So if you cast a spell after her, you have to wait a whole go around the table. And this can feel like an eternity when you just want to cast that nine minute spell to end the, end the last person's life. So it really helps to be able to do stuff instant speed to try to get around counter spells and to try to get around any removal that is sorcery speed or board wipes, for example. Um, all very, very important. And um, in this sort of deck where I'm trying to cast eight, nine, eight minute spells, that really helps to get around counter spells, especially be able to cast it very most opportune time. And next we'll go on with the enchantments. We'll start out with Mana Reflection. Mana Reflection, this deck is very, like, just extremely mana hungry. Um, and so it's the only mana doubler I have. I previously did have a Zenicar Surgeon, I believe, in it. However, uh, there are a lot of ways to benefit off of the draw card when you cast the creature part of Zenicar Surgeon, and seven mana is slightly too much. Um, and doesn't that that one doesn't double my artifacts. And this, since this deck does have three or four artifacts that can tap for mana, mana reflection is a better fit since it doubles every sort of permanent uh, mana production that I have. And uh, this is the pretty foil art from Double Masters. And next we have a pair of, or a trio, I should say, of hate damage cards. Uh, starting with Polluted Quandary, um, my deck has a lot of access to excessive card draw because of Thrasios and how effective he is. And so um, Painful Quandary helps me use my advantage to, uh, you know, out-advantage uh, out my three opponents. 
an exquisite blood. I don't have the infinite combo with Sanguine Bond in this deck because I don't have much in the way of life gain. So it'd really be counting on me to have exquisite blood or to have one of my two equipments in order to uh, benefit from it. And I don't love winning with infinite combos anyways, uh, but exquisite blood can really help uh, late in the game, especially um, whenever I do damage, I gain that much life, or I gain that much life. And um, this plays really well when you get to the last person because then every time I hurt them, I push them further and further from being able to kill me. And then Wound Reflection, uh, just like the Demon, ha which has the same sort of ability, uh, really, really good to double damage at the end of turn. And this really normally pushes the game out of reach for them as they try to claw their way back into it. Then we have a couple of card advantage cards. Of course, uh, Ristic Study, a, uh, you know, an old vet in Commander. And then Miles Dil Dilation. Um, it says whenever a opponent casts his or her first spell each turn, that player exiles the top card of their library. If it's a non-lane card, I can cast it without paying it for a mana cost. And this actually does allow me to cast the card, which enables Vile Smasher even more. And um, usually they um, hit a land, because generally that's just the sort of luck I have. However, every now and then they'll hit their 9 mana spell, and they really, you should just see their faces when they, when they play a small, inconsequential spell just to be doing something, and they hit a 9 mana spell that I'm able to both cast and damage them for. Uh, it's especially funny if they're the one that takes the damage. This card's crazy pow powerful. It does um, stick around on the board uh, and present a huge target. And usually it's, it's the right thing to remove it unless it's so late in the game that it just doesn't matter. But it's very powerful, but it does uh, leave itself vulnerable there for a turn or so. Uh, if the first person has removal for it, I've spent 7 of the mana. Maybe just to do 7 damage, which is not great. But man, if it, if it works, it is so powerful. And next we have... Myth Unbound. Uh, whenever you have two commanders, this card gets a lot better. It makes each of my commanders converted, or my their commander attacks, one rather than two. So Th uh, Thrasios becomes three mana if he dies, and then four, and then five, rather than four, and six, and eight. And that just really helps, because I really need them on the board. It also draws me cards sort of as a sign of a secondary effect. Even if it just had the top effect, it would probably be good enough. I really like this card, but I've, I only really have one green partner deck that I, that I have at the moment. And uh, so it's the only place I play it. However, it's a very good card. And uh, I, don't, I haven't seen it much, but I do have high expectations for it. It's one of the cards that sort of it goes in and out of the deck as the game goes on. Next, we have Training Grounds. It says activated abilities, creatures I control cost two less. And uh, it says the effect can't reduce it to less than one. However, Thrasios costs four mana to activate. And Training Grounds makes that two mana. And the jump from four mana down to two mana to activate Thrasios is world's difference. It's crazy powerful. And um, especially if I can play a land off of it, um, I mean, it's just ridiculously broken. It's just yet another artifact that they have to use removal on or it's going to win the game by itself. And speaking of artifacts, or enchantments, I mean to say, that are going to win the game by themselves, we have Awakening. Awakening is just the enchantment version of Seedborn Muse for me. Uh, it's slightly worse uh, because although the... Uh, Converted mana cost is the same. It does let everybody untap all creatures and lands. But I'm really usually the only one that's built to take you know take advantage of it fully. And it also has the benefit of being an enchantment, which means it's even harder to kill. Uh, yet another card that means that Thrasios will just take over the game and win the game on his own. Uh, once you get so much of an advantage out of Thrasios, a uh, Vile Smasher is almost a you know second thought because you have so much. Your board presence is crazy. Your hand is crazy, and your lands are you know you have nearly the entire. Uh, land base on the field. It's just really hard to overcome that once Thrasios gets rolling. And, uh, you know, there's a reason that he has the reputation that he does. It's because he is very broken and very good. Uh, nextly, we have my instant speed spells. Uh, starting with two free-to-play spells if I have either one of my commanders. And that's Deadly Rollick, uh, which lets me exile a creature. Of course, very good to exile anything. Uh, it gets around indestructible and things like that. Very important. And also triggers uh, Vile Smasher for four damage. So I really like the fact that the... Uh, Regular converted mana cost is kind of high on that one because I don't intend to ever use it for that. But I could if I needed to, I guess. And then Fierce Guardianship, which normally protects me late game or stops somebody from winning the game if I need to. And because I have two commanders because they're so cheap, generally I always have at least one out. Unless a board wipe just happened, I always have one out. And um, so this really has a lot of opportunity to be free spell for me and to counter a lot of the things that are going to slow me down. And also triggers Vile Smasher for that three damage. And next we have a few more interaction that has converted mana cost much higher than I ever intend to pay. The first one is Mortar's Cut. It lets me destroy target creature, but it has Delve. So it doesn't normally cost the five mana, and I can almost cast it, almost always cast it for the one mana. So one mana, instant speed, destroy target creature. 
very efficient. Uh, as efficient as any removal spell that's not in white, really. Then we have Curtain's Call that says for each opponent, it costs one less. So it's starting for a mana, cost is six mana. But even in a regular commander game where you have three opponents, uh, that's automatically three dam or three mana to destroy two target creatures. So, you know, nearly as, uh, you know, nearly as efficient as Murderous Cups, uh, absolute highest upside. Just very, very efficient. And also, they don't have much in the way of stipulations on when they work. Uh, next, we have another Delve card. We have Dig Through Time. It lets me look at the top seven cards and put two of them in my hand and the rest in the bottom of my library in any order. Um, I can usually always cast this after the games went on for a minute because so many of my spells are sorceries and instants, and I have fetch lands in the sort. Um, my graveyard fills fairly quickly, despite the fact that my converted mana cost is so high. So I can usually delve away all six to pay for the color of the spell, so the part of this spell. And then for two mana, I get to do this very, very powerful effect, and then hit somebody for eight. So the, this is, yeah, I really like this deck in the fact that um, I really enjoy when uh, cards are over-costed, or at least appear over-costed, although, of course, the delve means that this generally always costs about two mana. Even when you got to cast it for three or four mana, it's just a great effect for that. Then we have two removal spells. Uh, both of them instant speed. First one, Beast Within. Just lets me hit absolutely anything. And then Windgrace Judgment, five mana, does seem like a lot, but it also lets me hit three of, uh, you know, one of each opponent's at anything. And it's very, very efficient. You don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot of spots in here devoted for non-creature removal, and so the ones I have have to be very, very broad. And then lastly, uh, in the form of my first Wrath Effect, we have Cyclonic Rift, and this is a full art from Double Masters. Very beautiful. Just yet another card I'm trying to, uh, improve my deck's visual appeal as much as possible since this is uh, probably my favorite commander deck, although it's very, very powerful. So despite the fact that I've made it pretty as much as I can so far, um, it is very, very good. So I try not to pull it out because I don't want to wear, all the, wear it out to welcome. Next, go to my sorcery speed cards. First, we have Belaged Recovery. Uh, you have another card that lets me um, both have a card to cast and bring back one of my powerful, powerful spells that I'm trying to win the game with, but also lets my land base be a little lower. And, uh, you know, it's very important to not get flooded in this deck, even though, and Thrasios can even um, help me dig past my lands, but this deck can get flooded. Generally, it doesn't matter because Thrasios sort of solves that problem because if I get flooded, then he'll put cards in my hand anyways. But, uh, you know, it helps to have other ways to get around that, and Balligator Recovery is amazing for that effect. And then next, we have my ramp package, starting with my two-mana ramp, which is three visits and Nature's Lord, just the absolute best ramp spells in Commander. Um... Nature's Lord doesn't have a uh, alternative full art or like a foil that I absolutely love, but this art by Therese Nielsen is still amazing. Although she is blacklisted, she was an amazing artist, and um, you know this art is just the absolute best for Nature's Lord. And then the three visits, which I could not believe when it got reprinted, had the full art, and, and it's just fantastic. All my all of my favorite decks, I, I gave the uh, I could put a copy of this full art in, and I really love it. I like fairies anyways, and just a really pretty card. Next we have. Oldies but goodies, and that is Cultivate and Kadama's Reach, each with their own interesting, unique art. And um, well, what these says, you know, put one card or one land card from my uh, library that's a basic land in my hand, and the other one in the battlefield tapped. Uh, three mana. Uh, of course, these cards are becoming less popular because they only really ramp you one mana. However, this deck is so mana hungry and color intensive that it's very, very important to have as broad a uh, you know option for mana as I can possibly have. And I'm trying to cast eight and nine mana spells here. So Thrasius uh, aside, I need to ramp. And these decks, are, these cards are very efficient. At that. And the last ramp that we have is Sky Shroud Claim. Sky Shroud Train lets me go and find. I've got dual lands in this deck, and I have uh, lots, a couple lands that have named land types on them and this says forest and comes in a plan tapped very very good card should go in any green deck and then next we'll start with my board wipes starting with blasphemous act of course it doesn't actually cost nine mana but battle smasher still still acts like it does then we have deadly tempest this deck doesn't have a whole lot of creatures so occasionally if i'm lucky enough to face a uh, tokens deck which can often uh, swing around my tiny blockers even if they have you know their scary death touch equipment attached to them uh, this punishes them for going wide and so it just provides a way to wipe the board which is very important for this deck i've got more than the average board wipes since i can recast my commanders fairly efficiently and uh this does another way to do damage so blossom is that costing one mana generally to do nine damage to somebody just crazy efficient and then continuing on with the board wipes we have kinder discovery and the creative pain and kinder discovery uh, let's me choose a creature type. I don't really have anything in the way of uh, tribal synergy in here. 
So I generally uh, name Berserker in order to uh, save my Vile Smasher because you don't see a lot of Berserker. It's definitely an underutilized creature type. Or if I need to um, name Merfolk, that's uh, the less popular of the two creature types attached to Thrasius since he is a uh, Merfolk wizard. And wizard tends to pop up more. But this lets me very selectively destroy my opponent's creatures without touching the two most important that I have. And then Decree of Pain lets me cast an 8 mana spell, but let me draw cards after. Of course, I have to tap out generally to cast all 8 mana of it, but getting all those cards in return really lets me close out the game on whoever's left after the board wipe resolves. And speaking of board wipes resolving, we have not quite an entire board wipe. Overwhelming Force, is, uh, the original um, text on it, does say destroy opponent's creatures, which really makes it seem like it destroys everyone's creatures that aren't mine. However, the Oracle text, as well as this Judge promo, did further clarify that I have to target an opponent and that only destroys their creatures. However, then I draw them any cards. Um, this card's really, really relevant late game when I have one opponent, or if I have an opponent that's gone really, really wide. Uh, just eight mana is a lot to cast a one person board wipe, but if it draws me, you know, six, seven, eight cards, then it looks a lot more efficient. And of course, I don't care about efficiency really because I'm trying to trigger Vile Smasher for massive damage. And since I don't care about efficiency, we have Plague Wind and Ingurix Wake. Destroys all of my opponent's creatures, although Gurix Wake also does Planeswalkers and just really leaves the board open for me. Uh, sometimes this means that uh, the handful of creatures I do have that have uh, noticeable power and toughness, namely those demons and the Inferno Titan, they can start swinging willy nilly and really lets me uh, close out the game near the end. Of course, 9 mana, they can't really come down before the end of the game anyways, because they're 9 mana. And next we have some card draw spells, starting with my one uh, legitimate Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> the only real one I have. And then um, Treasure Cruise, just another Dell spell. Uh, another This one can cost only 1 mana as well and draw 3 cards. And very important to have a full grip to have as many options as possible if I expect to close the game out. Next, we have Guided Passage. I love this card. It does cost uh, red, blue, and green, which is fantastic. Uh, but it you know doesn't fit in very many decks. But it's really fun to resolve. And if I hand it, if I show it to new players, and they're the ones that get to choose my deck, um, you know they get really excited to be able to be able, to be able to look at the cards. And also, honestly, I really like this deck, and I like to show it to people. And so one of the easiest ways is to play this card and make them look at my deck. You know, just let them look at all the stuff I have. And you know, how do they choose? At what point of the game is any of these cards bad? Um, you know, it's like usually get like a cultivate and then a land that doesn't, you know, that I've already got redundant mana for. But after that, you have to choose a creature and all the creatures sort of in the game. So, pretty good card. Mostly then in there for fun though. Next we have Emergent Ultimatum. Emergent Ultimatum only gets monocolored cards, which seems like, you know, it can hold you back since a lot of my cards are double colored. Um, but these cards have such large effects that, you know, to get three of them and to give me two of them, you know, especially since I could cherry pick the two and cast them without converting man costs. Most of these, uh, late in the game, I've cast a lot of my uh, my ramp spells and things like that, and there aren't a lot of them left. So, you know, usually there's uh, two of the cards that aren't as great, but there's normally one card at the very least that can end the game. And sometimes because the converted mana cost is the only thing of importance with File Smasher, it doesn't matter what they hand me as long as something has a high CMC. Although Emergent Ultimatum would have triggered the ability first hand, but either way. Next we have Cut. Cut is just a, a, a two-minute removal spell for a creature, and that, of course, would be a terrible reason to play it. But then, of course, the Ribbons, the Aftermath, lets me make each opponent lose X life. And because this deck can produce 12 to 15 mana on the regular by turn 7 or 8, um, very important, you know, if this gets in the graveyard, or if I have to mill it, if I haven't delved it yet, you know, uh, uh, both things are relevant, and the second one's very good. And then much in the theme with the... Ribbons, we have Torment of Hellfire and Exsanguinate. You know, uh, if the X ends up being 10 on one of these, then I deal the damage because of Vile Smasher right away to somebody randomly. And then after that, the, the spell resolves. So sometimes the person has no choice. They just lose. You, you know, they could have 30 life, and if I cast uh, one of these for 8, somebody takes 10, and then they have to resolve, you know, then they if it's Torment, you know, then they have to resolve... X three times, and if a board wipe just happened, which I have many, so often I'm the one that's responsible for the board wipe, you know, then they have no choice but to, you know, take a further 15 or so damage, and that can just put them out of the game. And Exsanguinate, uh, another, like I said, life game really pushes me to the end of the game. So this one doesn't normally kill people, although it could. Uh, usually it just gets me, it buys me another two turns so that I can finish closing out the game, which is usually why I play Exsanguinate. 
Next we have Treacherous Terrain. Uh, Treasure Strain deals uh, damage to each opponent equal number of lands that player controls. I have several people in my playgroup that love to vomit out lands and to have 20 lands by the end of the game on a consistent basis. So 8 mana, dis despite the high converted mana cost, be able to deal 20 damage to somebody. You know, that you're not going to survive that. And then if early in the game I can basic land cycle it and it does mana fix. I wish that more of the basic land cycling cards uh, were relevant. There are a few that are good. Uh, I think that's the best one for this deck, though. And then next we have two cards that also benefit from the fact that I have two different commanders, and that's Skullstorm and Genesis Storm. Each of these cards say whenever I cast a spell, I copy it for each time I've cast my commander from the command zone in this game. Because I have two commanders, usually by the time I get to the nine or the six mana, respectively, that these cards cast, I can usually cast them and get four copies of them. And revealing the top cards of my library until I have revealed four different non-land permanents and put them in the battlefield... Um, for Genesis Storm, is you know that normally is good enough to end the game. And Skull Storm, uh, halving their life isn't that big a deal, um, but halving their life four times or five times, you know, you, it's easy to go to forty to four before long. You know, it's just very and the the art on these is amazing, especially the Skull Storm, that flying skull. I just love it. I haven't found another home for it, so I really like it for that fact. And then next we have Aminatu's Augury. I have a fairly even distribution. I mean, it's not. It's mostly sorcery, to be honest. But I have a fair amount of each um, card type in this deck. So Aminatu's Augury often gets me at least three cards and lets me cast them. And, you know, it costs eight mana, so I get the eight mana damage, worth of damage for Bile Smasher. And then I get three, you know, very game-ending cards for the next go-round, giving me even more answers. And I haven't found a whole lot of uh, homes for this card uh, because most of my decks have a a heavy slant into one of the card types, but this one has a fairly uh, good distribution, so it actually works out pretty well. And then lastly, we have two cards that are just blatantly unfair, uh, but I don't have a lot of homes for them, and I know that this deck's powerful, so I just kind of leaned into it. Time Stretch lets me take two extra turns, and Expropriate, uh, worst case scenario, if it resolves, lets me take one extra turn and steal th oh, each person's best thing. And so either one of those things is normally enough to just completely end the game. And then lastly, we have my lands package. Being four color, I don't have a lot in the op as far as land options, but I do try to play uh, a fair amount of basic lands when given the opportunity. Uh, here I have two of each basic lands. These are the full art from Unstable, and they're really pretty, just another way I've uh, chosen to bling out my deck. And because we really want to hit green mana in order to continue ramping, and because uh, lands that help us ramp even a little bit, although these don't really ramp, they really just provide uh, more mana in my opening hand than I would have otherwise had. Uh, I don't want a whole lot of coming to play tap lands because I really want to hit my curve in this deck, uh, but I do play the three green uh, playable Karoo lands. And next we have two tri lands. They are the Jund and the Grixis tri land. And then two more tri lands, being the Sultai and the Teemer. Um, Triumphs. Uh, at some point, when they print the other half of the Triumphs, I will switch out Savage uh, Lands and um, Crumbling Necropolis uh, for the other two because I just like them better. The art's better, and they have the land types, so in every way they'll be better. Uh, but these let me early game fix when I cast a fetch land or I do my land search for Sky Shroud Claim. I can go get my Ketray Triumph and my Zagoth Triumph and immediately have my mana fix for the rest of the game. And Savage Lands are much better, or the uh, Tri Lands are much better, I should say. Uh, for early in the game, I can just provide uh, a tapped land in order to try to fix myself. Next, we have two of the multiplayer lands, and I've got Spar Garden and Morphic Pool. Uh, these each uh, provide a combined total of the four colors I'm playing. That's why I play these uh, two. I didn't have a whole lot of open land spots in this deck, but I chose these two. At the time, they were the ones that were out. Now that they've completed this thing, I might go back and look at the other ones that are available to me. But for now, those are the two I play. Then I have Homeward Path. Homeward Path is the only colorless land that I play, but it's so important that I, ha I keep control of Vile Smasher. Otherwise, my deck doesn't have much in the way of a win condition. So, if something happens to him, I'm in a really tough spot. Now, I really don't have a whole lot of options if uh, he gets... I mean, I've got a few answers, but if he gets turned into an indestructible creature with Dark Steel Mutation or turned into a land, you know, for example, I have a hard time getting rid of it. But if he gets taken, I've got Homeward Path. Next, we've got my fetch land package, of which I have six playable in color fetch lands. And fetch lands are very important because it's a four color deck, and um, they really let, they let me shuffle my deck as well, um, which can come into play if I feel like my draws are getting stale, or if I happen to know what's on the top of my library. Then we have all six dual lands, 
super fake, the whole lot of them. Uh, but they're like a, a small fortune to purchase. And uh, so I think fake is the only way to buy these. Especially since I hand my deck out. Never going to give $2,000 to somebody that could just walk off with it. And then next we have a couple of cheap fetch lands. Not so cheap anymore, especially for Prismatic Vista. But both of these let me, for different ways, uh, tap and sacrifice to go search for lands. Providing more land fixing. And then we've got just... Taps for any, any any one of my colors and the occasional scribe. But generally, it's only the scribe if I recast one of my commanders since they don't have a lot of in common uh, creature types. Uh, but it, mainly, it's coming to play tapped for any of my colors for the Path of Ancestry. Then we have three more taps for any colors. Uh, Exotic Orchard is not technically tapped for any colors, but usually it hits just like the Felwer Stone earlier. It usually taps for at least three of my colors. And then Forbidden Orchard, of course, it does give them a 1-1 uh, fairy. However, that fairy does not fly, which is easy to miss because you think it's a fairy. It must fly, but it just doesn't. So that does come into play because they can't really hit you with it if you have a commander. And then Mana Confluence will start to deal damage to me. But at this point, I do have four or five ways to gain life back. And generally, my, lana, my mana is so fixed that by the time it would actually start to matter, it would start to add up very high, I can just uh, ignore tapping it. Or, you know, it's a one land that I'll keep untapped if I need to. And then lastly, we have my Full Art Command Tower. And just uh, add, add absolute auto include in all two-color decks. Really in all decks, except for monocolor decks or colorless decks. I mean, it's just a really good card. And a good, nice, born way to end the deck. Anyways, again, that is my Vile Smasher and Thrasios deck. If you liked them, I'll try to put a... Uh, my architect link in the bio. Um, thank you.